Good afternoon and welcome to Learn Some Series with me, Kim Brits, proudly powered by leadershipbydesign.co, leading the charge with insights, information, and ultimately effective results. Joining me in today's leadership and coaching segment, human and talent, uh, talent-centered strategist, executive coach, agile people advocate, and HR leadership expert, Anya van Beek. Anya, how are you doing? Hi, Kevin. I'm doing well. So lovely to be here with you again. Yes, I, I was recently on the show just discussing um, this is the first time that the, the, the lunchtime series has, got, has gone through a an election. <laughs> okay, wow. So, um, yeah, this is our, uh, this is four, uh, yeah, four years already that we've been going strong and still heading at uh, Congratulations. Yes, for me, in my mind, it feels as if it's been there forever. So <laughs> I did not realize that there's still first for you. But what an amazing first. But congratulations. Yeah, and uh, thank you. And um, so for me, it's, uh, you know, just having that recognition kind of going, well, wow, that's that's pretty, f you know, four years is, uh, you know, just over like that. But I've had such amazing conversations with uh, uh, people like yourself and, and, uh, you know, across the world, and still some really great conversations coming up in the next month or so. Um, can I just quickly ask something totally off topic? So, yes. that, did you start, or was COVID then the jump start of this lunchtime series, or was it just a coincidence that it was the same here? It was the actual jump start because um, I was in bed scrolling through Facebook and I was seeing people post all the the sadness that they were going through and the loss that they were going through and i felt so uh disabled because of the situation so i you know i thought to myself like so what could i potentially do and everyone was suddenly jumping online and having online virtual everything uh and i was like well what if i had really just short conversations about marketing and we started with marketing and pr so how do you market your business now online how do you do that and and then it went to, okay, so let's have leadership conversations. Let's have, I've had like a psychologist on and he was on for about six month period. And especially when people were going through a really tough time around psychology and, you know, how COVID impacted them. So yeah, COVID was a huge catalyst to the lunchtime series existing. Uh, and here we are four years later. Just oh, that's an amazing success story. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. But I mean, with that, um, oh, uh, I want to mention, so uh, look out for it because I'm going to have a specialist on the show who's going to discuss trauma and the combination that trauma has and the impact that it has on leadership. But that's coming up in the next month. So check that out. But I mean, under today's conversation, we want to be speaking about um, some of the biggest challenges that leaders are facing. Uh, we know that uh, uh, back at work kind of, implementation of like yes are we going to have people back at work and are we making a sort of a blanket statement and saying everyone has to be back at work um and then where's that hybrid model fit in and does it fit in uh and which which areas are you know the, um especially hr i think hr it affects hr quite a, a lot because a lot of policy wasn't written for people just working hybrid models or you know, so I just think that in itself has become quite a challenge for leaders uh, and to understand what leaders uh, are going through. What are some of the areas that you've noticed that, I mean, because I mean, HR is your thing and, and, you know, it's a background that you've been in for many years. Mm, yeah, thank you for, for asking specifically relating to HR. Yeah, I think the hybrid and the work from home policy has been a nightmare for quite a few people because it worked so well. Well, let me first put it from an employee's perspective, it worked so well during COVID when we were still locked down and you had to set up your home office and make everything work. And now suddenly management is just saying we need to be back. And I mean, if you consider work life and the commuting, the hours on the road, the time that you waste just driving to work there's a lot of question around is it viable or not and i think then from leadership's perspective to consider but if we say yes for work from home or hybrid or work at office full-time if we say yes to that what are we saying no for 
And I think that definitely highlights a, such an important conversation because, as you said, there's just so many different aspects to consider with regards to insurance. And if something happens to you, you know, where does the responsibility lie, etc. cetera. Um, but I think what I have seen is it seems as if the hybrid ways of working is definitely the way to go nowadays. Most of the people that I interact with has a policy looking at two days at the office, or at home and three days at the office. So it's definitely a blend. Um, but I think it, it also varies from uh, industry to industry because certain industries are more prone to, yes, it's viable to work at home. Um, but it also touched on another topic that I see, and it's looking at the changing workforce. Um, I don't know if we've spoken about this before, but looking at five different generations in the workplace and often people are managing um, team members that's a lot older than themselves, that they could have been, you know, even parents if you look at the age gap. And I think just looking at the five generations. And then one thing that I also see in HR specifically now is looking at technology. Because, I mean, if you think of HR and they want to be more strategic and not necessarily only focus on the admin side, how do we leverage technology in order to be more strategic? And then the whole implication of, yeah, what's the HR system that we use? How does it implement or merge with the applicant tracking system if you do online recruitment? So, yeah, so many. That's just the two or three that comes to mind for me, Kevin. Yeah, I, I love that you that you mentioned the, the generations because I, you know, also the work that I do, um, it's it crosses that that age from you know anything from 22 years old to 50, 65 years old, and <laughs> you kind of look at that and you know very specifically, 65 year olds struggle to understand 22 year olds, and vice versa, right? Um, so I mean. With that said, they, like my immediate approach to or, or thinking process would be to really then become quite curious about, well, how do we handle that more specifically? How do we handle that better? Um, I mean, even to your technology point, and I mentioned you before, before the show, you know, people have this this uh, un, unequivocal kind of approach to technology as if technology and AI is just simply going to take over everything. Um, and recently saw someone speaking on a podcast around um, what people are not realizing about AI is that as humans, we still, we have that human connection that we need, that we, it's just, a, it's, it's built into our psyche, you know, so there may come a point where we having a conversation I mean, I just look at the banks when, you know, the, the moment the banks uh, sort of answers the call and says, you're speaking to a, <laughs> to a robot, uh, what, you know, um, you press this button to kind of make sure that we get it right. And immediately I get angry and I'm like, I don't want to speak to her. I want to speak to a human, right? So, I mean, to me, you know, things like that factor into EQ, right? It comes back to how do we, how do we connect to human beings and, um, you know, how do we do this better? But I mean, like, from your perspective, how do we solve a bit of the generation gap? How do we solve that people are on the same, um, on the same plate? Yeah, and I think that is uh, such an interesting one because for me, it really boils back to let's acknowledge and let's focus on embracing the diversity. Because it's like you said, a 60 year old, see the problem or the issue or the decision that we need to make from a totally different viewpoint than a 25 year old and i think it's important then looking at the quality of conversations and the quality of discussions that we have in order to make better decisions but it's not only about making decisions so i think it's it's really about as i said embracing that diverse view and welcoming the first the, the the diverse views and then everyone to actually have an open mind to say okay let me just pause for a minute and listen because often especially if we're brainstorming or if you want to get your point across so often as individuals we listen to respond and we don't necessarily listen to um understand 
And I mean, if I'm thinking of AI and uh, just the example that you use from, um, from the banks would be that, I mean, when you want a human to listen, because we can actively listen on a different level, listening to the nuances in the voice, in the tone, in the body language, what, you know, what your body language is saying is subtle. Sometimes you don't even realize you're picking it up. So I think back to the generations, it's just that having that open mind. But to your question about um, how can we be on the same page, I think that's re-emphasizing the importance of that purpose. What are we here for? I mean, and I think that is why, you know, I'm so passionate about talking about do we have that sense of belonging and do we have that social safety where we feel that we make a meaning for contribution and for me step one would be okay but what's the overarching purpose i might have a different view based on my age or my experience or whatever but let me bring my views to the table in order to serve our customers better or in order to do whatever the purpose of the organization might be so i think there's a lot to say about mutual purpose or the purpose of the organization when we think of different generations. I don't you also find as you're speaking around it, you know, embracing the diversity and, you know, becoming a little bit more curious about other people and or someone who's different than me, um, but also open to that view and purely based on the fact that you are able or willing at least to have the conversation of, well, I wonder what this person's view is. I wonder what this conversation could potentially be. I think sometimes people get they get so stuck in the busyness of the conversation or the end goal of you know what it is they're trying to reach or, or trying to achieve at least um, that they forget there's a journey of navigation that's happening in between then and then. And essentially, as a business, a thriving business or a growing business for that matter. The journey is constantly changing. There's a constant influence of something happening. And then it becomes uh, a question of like, how agile are you in the approach that you're having around these generations? You know, they are so different. They, they, they come from so many diverse kind of uh, thinking processes. I mean, like a simple thing, you know, a 65 year old uh, didn't have TikTok. But today, a 20-year-old has TikTok. And you kind of go, just that in itself, it's a simple example. But how does that uh, influence the, the way that they go about making decisions, the way that they, they, in, they inform themselves about the world? You know, um, All of these little things that we often overlook and we kind of go, well, this is the goal. We need to get there now and we need to get there as soon as possible. But we skip the journey. We forget that there's an actual journey. Absolutely, and I cannot agree with you more. So what came to mind for me when you talk about Agile is once again to remember that the Agile ways of working is really focused on a few uh, four values and a few principles, and that's what's important. So it is about face-to-face -face wherever we can, wherever it's possible, or at least um, don't say face to face, but at least let's have a look, see one another. You know, it's not cameras off type of policy. It's things like let's experiment and learn. And I think especially in the world where we operate today, where there's uncertainty and complexity, and we actually don't know what is the right decision to say, okay, but let's try this and this and that one to see which one might work out or pan out the best. So I think it's adopting that mindset of, I'm going to try this, let me experiment, let me reflect on what's working and not working so that I can tweak and go forward in a different way. But the other thing that sparked my mind when you were talking about um, understanding is, remember we said uh, emotional intelligence is so important. And whenever I think of emotional intelligence, one aspect that comes to mind is empathy. And a lot of the time, people forget that we have different types of empathy. And the one empathy meeting of minds where you have the cognitive empathy and really understanding where that individual is coming from. I think that's the one that's relevant because 
I, when we meet, when our minds meet as a 65 year old or 25 year old or whatever, someone from sales versus someone from consulting, when we, um, I have cognitive empathy, then I understand your viewpoint because I can put myself in your shoes. And I think that's the important that people need to embrace. Often we think that empathy is, I feel what you're feeling. Yes, and that is effective empathy, but that's not the one that's important in the complex world that we not only important in the complex world that we work in. So uh, while you're talking to it, I one of the conversations, I mean, and you and I, you know, because we do this and we and we're passionate about it, um, the 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 question that sort of sparks an interest to me is like, why are we still having a conversation around EQ, right? And the first thing that comes to mind is, you know. Um, the triggered responses we we so easily fall into right and instead of looking at yourself and kind of go well i'm that's quite i'm so interested in why that thing is triggering me right we don't even as as triggered individuals we tend to not do that right i mean having a triggered response like the fact that you're not self-evaluating and having a self-awareness around that that is that means you don't have that that eq of yours is is out of whack it could potentially be right so it's like paying attention to how you're responding to the world um you know ineffective um communication right when you when you think of uh one of the law of records or, or the one of the rules of of nlp in itself is uh when communicating uh, and you see that you don't receive the communication or the person's not receiving the communication that you intended, then you've got to change your communication, right? Which means you have to be more self-aware. And, you know, so EQ, I think it's, it's when people generally speak about it, they, and again, I'm making a, a generalization about it, but people generally tend towards this mushy stuff. It's, you know where i am when you if you really investigate it eq in itself as a leadership skill is an intelligence skill to have it's not a mushy skill to have it's it's an absolute hardcore skill where when you do it well uh you really do leadership better and i actually i was uh, talking last week to a group of software engineers and uh, well, we were talking about soft and hard skills because, I mean, obviously for them, the technical side of their job is so important. And I've shared a stat with them, and I think it was Harvard's, Harvard Business Review, but don't quote me, I think it was them. But their research found that 85% of career success links back to what we or what some people call soft skills. And I think that is why I would rather think of them as power skills. And I think EQ definitely fits in there as well. But I mean, when you were talking about EQ in posing the question, why are we still talking about that? I think it actually focus um, or put the focus on another issue that I see in the workplace, and it's everything around well-being. Because I mean, think four years back when you started your lunchtime series. Um, I almost want to make a bold statement that well-being was not one of the topics front of mind. But I mean, since the pandemic, since everything, well-being and just self-care is such an important topic nowadays. And I think that is when you ask me the question of EQ, for me, it really starts with where's your focus as a leader? Yes, we have a strategy, we have a business, we have the stakeholders to be um, that we need to show returns. But do you understand that if you create that environment, where people really want to come to work and want to be their best when they at work. That's where well-being and EQ and all those things definitely makes an impact. And again, for the listeners as a leader, just saying, but where's your focus? Is your focus only on the strategy, only on the ROI, and only on the profit? Because then you might underestimate the impact of you know, the social part and the people part of your business because they, the, the better, I want to say, the more comfortable they feel and the more, con not comfortable, let's say confident they feel um, in the workplace, um, the more 
they can provide the profits that you require. So I think there's a well-being topic that's also important. Absolutely. But Anya, from your pers <coughs> sorry, from your perspective, um, one of the things that just some of the notes that I have made um, around EQ as well, especially for leaders, is the ability to the ad the ability to adapt quickly, but also that that uh, another very hardcore skill is resilience. You know, very often, you know, when things go wrong, when things I look at um, the the elections that have just happened and how that has put such pressure uh, and such edginess on decisions and people making decisions and understanding what the future and absolutely elections a big deal it's going to affect the country we know why it's you know a big deal but part of that leadership skill and part of that uh, one of the challenges that we mentioned when we started in the conversation today is how well are you or, uh, able to to get back to you know your resilient self and get back to uh, not getting sucked in into the emotional state or the drama of you know the situation but how do you how well are you able to manage the stress uh, and recover from your own setbacks that happen uh, and when when you don't when you you know actively are um, cultivating a, a, a really strong sense of emotional intelligence part of that requires you to be able to look at the circumstances and kind of go okay um how do i i, I get it it's not comfortable um what is my next best possible you know step that i can take to where i'm going here so i mean from your perspective adaptability and resilience how, yeah. important, how important is this they, they're critical i mean if i think of just so many scenarios um, of coaching clients that I speak to, even group sessions that I do. But adaptability, I think, is one of the most important skills because change is not going away. It's only going faster and faster. And we see that, the uncertainty. I mean, thinking of decisions that you need to make and the data that you want to have before you're making the decision. And now tomorrow there's something. I mean, you need to be able to be adaptive the whole time. But that in itself, I think, requires resilience. And a lot of the time, people think of resilience as I need to have grit and I need to have tenacity. And it's so much more than that because resilience is actually having learning. So a lot, let me put it this way. A lot of the time, people think resilience is bouncing back. But it's not only about, about bouncing back. It's about bouncing back and higher the next time. So really looking at what did I learn from this adversity or the, the reason why I had to be adaptive or, you know, agile in the first place. So what was the lesson? And I think that boils back then to the whole concept of growth mindset. As an individual, what's the glasses that you look at the world? Do you see it as opportunities to learn and grow? And I think if you think of resilience, the one I don't know if I've ever mentioned this to you, but the one um, application that I often use in my coaching practice is the Neurozone application. And that's a powerful tool that was designed by Dr. Etienne van der Walt and his, knee, and his team. They're based in Cape Town. And the Neurozone app is looking at an individual because there's so many different aspects impacting resilience. And they had to look at an individual and say, okay, these are your top six that you need to focus on because it's different for me and for you. But I mean, what always astounding, what's astounding for me is to think of some of those things that they share are basics. I mean, if you think of foundational drivers for resilience are things like your sleep-wake cycle, are things like your exercise routines, are things nutrition-wise. Even you've mentioned that the emotional state, but how do you handle um, negative thought patterns, as an example. So all of those things, we all know. But I often ask, what do you do actively because of the knowledge that you have? Because that's what I have seen a lot, especially this year, is that people know what's the right habit to form or the right decision to make. Even think of strategy. A leader might think that I want to do a strategy and I know the best thing is to involve the team or at least, you know, get a conversation around where 
uh, where we want to go in the next five years. But do, do they just know that? Or are they actively doing that? And I think that's the, the that's almost the the nudge that I see. People have all the knowledge, be it strategy, be it resilience, be it making decisions, be it building a culture that people thrive. But what do we do? Because I think it's that action that I see sometimes is missing. Yeah, I, I, and I love that you make that point because. I always ask, you know, in any given setting, is is knowledge power? And, you know, invariably everyone's like, yes, no, knowledge is power, absolutely. And then I always go, no, it's not, right? And then everyone has this response is like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, knowledge is absolutely pointless if there's no action that's applied to it, right? Um, because then you're just someone who has a lot of information and not doing anything about it. So knowledge isn't power, applied knowledge is power. Right. So, and I think that's such an important point that there requires an action and it requires a, a, a sense of like, okay, I understand what I, what's happened in my world. Um, what is my next action I'm going to be taking around the thing that's just occurred? Right. And I think that's the, it comes back to that self-awareness. But I mean, just to tie it up with one of the points that we mentioned earlier, especially around resilience again and this the ability to recognize you know this is the situation this is what's happening when technological disruption or digital transformation steps in into you know into play uh, and how you how adaptable you are you know it ties back to exactly what you were speaking about around the applied knowledge uh, the growth mindset the actions that you're taking um, because and again, a generalization I've made, but a lot more older people and uh, people who who have tend to kind of be the decision makers to a large degree, avoid the, digi the digital transformation route. They avoid what technology could potentially mean for an environment. You know, so they in because they don't understand it or because it's new and it's not something they're used to, uh, it just creates discomfort. And we know, like you said, change is it's not going away, right? It's there, it's it's constant. So lean into the discomfort, right? And I always tell my you know my clients that the degree of your discomfort is the degree of your learning. But the moment you lean into the discomfort, you kind of go, wow, this is uncomfortable, man, but what am I learning here? Right. And having that kind of thought process really helps you. Uh, enable you with with a small tactic on how to deal with the discomfort right so that applied knowledge is so critical for us to be able to get to where we're going and that ties back to that journey it's part of the journey and i mean even as you speak if you just think of back to the conversation about different generations now let's again say the older generation that we did not grow up with the technology and you mentioned TikTok. We can actually use any any of those examples. And now think of recruiting the newbies, the, the younger generations. Mm -hmm. They want things on the tip of their hands. That's where they operate. I mean, if you can't do it on the phone, I mean, why waste time? And if you think of the recruitment process, how, do, how easy do we make it for the new people to apply and to get feedback and to know what's going on, even when you appoint them? And you think of onboarding, are you making use of technology to streamline the process and to make it interactive and, you know, fun? And that is why, again, we're back to the diversity. And I love your point of stretching yourself out of your comfort zone because it might not be something that you need or you require. But, yeah, let's have a look at the other generations, if we other employees, for that matter, of what's required to be future fit for them. But, I, you know, just to the point where one of the things, um, you know, the, the book actually touches on this is, you know, the five core critical skills that the future of work we, we really need to focus on. Um, and it's creativity, critical thinking, social intelligence, um, self-management and, and attention management. And when you look at them, you know, from that perspective, you suddenly realize, ah, you know, as a, as a core critical skill, Part of me tapping into that generational knowledge from 65 to 25, you know, across the board, part of that requires me to be in socially intelligent, 
right? So as a core critical skill for the future of where work is headed, um, you can't sort of avoid it, you know? Uh, socially intelligent people are gonna be thriving, uh, you know, in the future of work. But with that comes self-management and how, how well are you at managing self? Right? How well are you at managing your own emotional state or your own strategy that you're applying to your life or your own goals that you're setting as part of this journey? Um, how well are you at managing self, right? So when you when we're unpacking it like this, it just ties it back to <laughs> what the book says, right? And it's like, how do you really, really understand how to upskill your own leadership? And that's a really good way of doing it. No, absolutely. And I think that is why when you look at all these, you've shared an article with me. And I mean, if I look at all of these topics, cultural competence, ethical leadership, um, what are some of the others? Critical thinking, I think, or changing the work, you know, the changing workforce, um, decision making in the face of uncertainty. All of those comes back to conversations and the quality of conversations that you can have with the team. Irrelevant if it's now talking about resilience, talking about the hybrid world of work, whatever it is. For me, I, I love that. Um, I, I think you call it social intelligence, and I'm not sure if conversations falls there, but I would think it does. Um, boils back to the power of having a quality conversation. Absolutely. So, Anya, if we if we have to do a bit of a synopsis of this and and kind of look at you know what is the 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 collective thought around today's conversation. I was just looking at some of the, the impact that EQ has on leadership. And uh, one of the first thing that's mentioned is improved communication, right? We can never be too, uh, too sure of how well we've communicated something because we know that everyone forms their own opinion according to the, how they put information together. So uh, having a really good way of communicating is always going to lead uh, you know, your 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 efforts as a leader. Uh, another one is conflict resolution. Uh, EQ enables leaders to navigate conflict with greater ease. Another one, empathy and relationship building, which we've already, you know, touched on specifically. Uh, the, the other one was touching on adaptability and resilience. And lastly, decision making. And I think another one that is so important, and that's also, you know, touching on that generational uh, sort of piece is, when we are curious enough to reach the generations and have those collaborating conversations uh, and really be curious enough to, to do that, um, it enables us to make better decisions, right? Uh, and informed decisions rather than just doing it from what I know or what I'm used to doing. How do I inform myself to have better conversations, to upskill myself uh, and become more self-aware? So I think Overall, you know, on all of these points that we've discussed, um, EQ in itself is is an actual quite a hard skill. It's not a it's not this fluffy, mushy kind of stuff. Uh, and the challenge I uh, put out to the listeners out there is, um, you know, how good are you at it? How good are, how good are you? Can you you know uh, sort of rate yourself on these five points and kind of go, yeah, I, I think I'm a nine out of ten or an eight out of ten, right? Or are you a three? And how honest can you be about how good you're at it? Because, and the thing is, I think most leaders, uh, again, through my experience, is most leaders just don't like to be wrong. They don't want to be wrong. It's not comfortable. It's never comfortable. But I mean, from your perspective, what would you what would you add to that? Yeah. So, Kevin, you have summarized it so so well. So, what I will do is I will put a different angle onto your question, because when the listeners rate themselves. I want them to think of a stressful scenario because I think it's easy to have empathy and to have good conversations and to make the right decisions when things are easy and straightforward. But as soon as you are under stress, what change and what would be the rating then? And I want to stretch them a little bit in their comfort zone and think when you're not your best self, what's your rating then? And then from that perspective, What's the one or two um, decisions that you can make in order to close that gap? Because, I mean, even me teaching this, I remember a recent conversation with one of my kids when, I mean, when you look at me, you would say, ah, oh, 
is that Anya because I behave as not that I would normally, you know, uh, think of myself as because I was under pressure, because my resilience was not very good at that point in time, and because I think even my self-care was not as good. So I was not at the best place to show up in that conversation with, with my kids. And I think that's what I want people to, to remember. When you're not good, what do you see? Because that's usually the guiding light as to what to do next or what to focus and learn on next. Yeah, I'm so glad that that's, you know, a point you make as well. I, and I often share, you know, uh, just the sentiment exactly to your point is we don't need great, we, we don't only need great leaders when things are going good. We need really great leadership when things are going bad. <laughs> because that's when when it really matters, right? Um, so guys, go, go and check it out. When you are not your best self, go rate yourself and check what that is. Uh, and also go and check yourself on, you know, those five points that we've made this morning. She's uh, one of the, well, she's a regular guest on, our, uh, on, the, on the podcast, but she's a human and talent-centered strategist, executive coach, agile people advocate, HR and leadership expert. Anya van Beek, thank you so much. Thank you for chatting and thanks for making some time to, to chat to me. Oh, thank you for the invite, Kevin. Always lovely to um, be with you on the show. Chat to you soon. Cheers for now. Bye. Bye.